All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I can't see any of you, um, but I know, I know you're out there. Some of you are out there on your computers. Some of you are out there uh, uh, doing it as a drive-in. Um, and, and I welcome all of you tonight. Uh, this is a very special evening for us. And we have the uh, author of, of the uh, Reading the Globe uh, Read, uh, Colin Broderick. Um, uh, you've all had a chance to read his book and, and to get to know him intimately through his book. At least I felt like I have. Um, this is the 13th uh, uh, year that we've done this. So I've read I've read 13 books um, and they all have very similar um a very similar theme, if you will, is how people have overcome adversity in their lives. And um, and, and it really is very moving. This book to me was was very moving. Um, I was telling Colin just a couple minutes ago, um, one of the things that, that, that caught my eye in the book um, was when he did his first communion and he had the uh, problem with the uh, with the host uh, being stuck to the uh, roof of his mouth. <laughs> And uh, I, I had exactly the same experience <laughs> at my first communion, uh -huh. and um, so and you weren't about to move. You weren't going to leave the altar. There's no way in God's earth you were going to leave the altar. The the nuns pretty much made the sure that you were the fear of God was in you, and so I had like everybody behind me kept whispering for me to leave so they could get in so that they could get in and and, and do their first communion. And it finally and it finally dissolved, and I was able to leave, but. No, Colin, I appreciate that more than probably more than than most people when reading your book. <laughs> Thank um, you. But Thank you. but but it it was a great. I, I really enjoyed your uh, talking about your relationship with your parents, and probably everybody I would guess that everybody who read your book can can relate to you know, some way in some ways to your to your relationship with your parents is how they the relationship they have with their parents. But I don't want to take up uh, your time. And so I will turn the uh, the podium, I guess, and whatever, turn the computer uh, over to you and uh, away you go. Thank you and so thank much. Thank you very much for, for joining such a, us. Such a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Arenas. Uh, what an honor to be here uh, virtually in uh, Laredo tonight. I'm so sorry that I could not be there in person. I was really looking forward to, to exploring Laredo and getting to meet everybody in person. Um, but good evening, Texas A&M uh, International University. Good evening, Dust Devils, and good evening, class of 2024. Uh, it's, it really is an honor to be here. Um, I'd like to start just by saying thank you to the people who have been working really hard to set this up. Uh, first of all, Haley Kazan, who has been amazing, who reached out to me about this at the beginning. Uh, Marina Hinosa, uh, I'm not sure if I've pronounced her name correctly. Uh, and Roberto Gonzalez, uh, who has been uh, amazing and instrumental in getting all this tech situation figured. Uh, if it were left up to me and uh, the good doctor, uh, there would be blank screens. <laughs> right now so uh stick with us and uh, and bear with us if there are any uh if 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 for instance the uh the video drops out or the audio drops out uh, know that we're doing our best and and we're on it and we'll be back in in a minute or two and we're going to stick with it and and hope, hopefully that doesn't happen but uh good to mention it up front uh i guess i'd like to start by just asking each of you, uh, where are you from? Um, identity has been such a huge part of my own self-discovery and uh, my own journey and finding out and discovering my own story and my own place in life. Uh, and when I ask you, where are you from, you know, being in America, uh, one of the things, you know, I always ask of people is where you're from, because really, if you're not 100 percent Native American, you know, we're all visitors here. Uh, and, you know, whether it's second generation or third generation, uh, where we all sort of arrived here one way or another. And it's good to remember that up front, uh, that we're all sort of connected. 
and they were all traveling and they were all sort of related in one sort of family uh, journey together. I was born uh, in Birmingham, England uh, in 1968 in the middle of a snowstorm. My parents, Michael and Claire, were very young at the time and they had uh, moved away from Ireland, where they are from, from Northern Ireland. And uh, they had moved to Birmingham, I guess, for work. And because they were young and they were in love and they didn't want to be around their own families and their own parents, and uh, they wanted some privacy uh, to be alone. Uh, while they were there, my father worked in a tea factory. My mother worked in a laundrette. And uh, my brother and I were born at home in a small flat in the area of Stratford uh, in Birmingham. And after I was two months old, my parents decided that they would be better at home in Ireland around family with two young children. So they packed us up and shipped everything back home to County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. But the fact that I was born in England has always been this sort of little, I guess that's where it all began, my, my sort of quest into my own identity. Because I guess if you really wanted to make the argument, you could say I was a little bit English because I was born in England. And yet I don't classify myself as English at all. Uh, I, I create a story around uh, growing up in, in the north of Ireland, which is where I did my growing up. And as I say, I was uh, born in 1968. For those of you who have read the book, you will know that at, at that time in the north of Ireland, uh, there was a lot of conflict. Uh, Catholics who were considered native Irish uh, at the time felt like they were being oppressed by the British government and British military forces. And what happened was really it was a civil rights issue. It was the same civil rights issue that was happening in America at the same time with Martin Luther King. Uh, and and the, the whole idea was that people went out, uh, Catholics went out and started marching in the streets to demand equality, equality in housing, equality in jobs. They wanted the same opportunities as our Protestant or English uh, neighbors had. And uh, to, to understand the political situation, you have to understand that the northern part of Ireland, of the island, the top six counties were under English control. Um, so, Irish people who lived in the north of Ireland felt oppressed by the English and the, the English had an English military presence in the north of Ireland. They got the best jobs, they got the best housing and the best schooling and Catholics were basically second rate citizens in our own country, really. In 1972, in January of 1972, uh, there was a civil rights march in Derry City and the British Army opened fire on uh, protesters, on civilians, unarmed civilians who were marching for civil rights. Uh, Fourteen civilians were killed that day. Uh, the first young boy who was killed, his name was John Jackie Duddy. And uh, if you ever go back and look at the Bloody Sunday is what it's known as historically, the iconic image from that, what happened, the horror of what happened that day in Derry is of a Catholic priest and he's got a little hanky, a little white hanky and they're carrying this bloodied boy uh, who was 17 years old, who had been shot in the back, unarmed uh, boy at the protest. That image, that iconic image is really, I feel, the image that sort of sparks 
the war in Northern Ireland that becomes known as the Troubles. Up until that point, there had been, you know, there had been shootings, there had been un, uh, unrest, there had been uh, marches. But until this time period, there were no cameras to catch it. And that's very important when you think about what's happening today in America with uh, body cams and people recording the action on the street. Uh, it, it was the first time that the rest of the world actually got to see what was happening in Northern Ireland. They couldn't deny, the British couldn't deny it anymore. Here it was, uh, uh, civil rights marchers being shot in the streets by British uh, armed forces. And uh, 26 people were shot, 14 were killed, uh, some of them children. And that moment sparked what became a 30-year war in Northern Ireland known as the Troubles. And I grew up in County Tyrone. When you, when you hear of the north of Ireland and the Troubles, you hear of Derry and you hear of Belfast. Those were the two main areas. And I grew up in County Tyrone, which was right in the middle. It was like farm country. And the area that I grew up in was infamous for the trouble that happened there. The young men had a lot of fight in them and they, they were fed up with the, uh, the, civil, uh, the civil unrest and the oppression uh, and you know, when I talk, I, I guess to personalize the idea of oppression, what is oppression? Um, oppression is feeling like, um, for instance, maybe you go for a drive to the village and uh, the police or the, 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 the British army would stop you and start questioning you. Where are you going? Where did you come from? Who are you? Why are you going to the store? Uh, what are you going to buy there? Why? Uh, who do you know? Who do you know who may be involved in the IRA? And this sort of uh, lawless uh, oppression by the British in Northern Ireland in their treatment of Catholics became more and more oppressive, more and more militant. And in response, Irish Catholics formed the IRA the Irish Republican Army, which was an underground uh, freedom fighting uh, army to stand up for the rights of Catholics in the north of Ireland. And they were a military representation of the Catholics in Northern Ireland against the British. So I was born in, in 68 and within you know 10 years, there was six children in our house. My parents were working class people. My father was a carpenter. My mother, God help her, stayed at home with... Uh... <laughs> now that I have children, I, I'm amazed that she did this. She had six children uh, that she got up and got ready for school every day. Uh, and I, 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 as a father of three young children, I can't imagine what that was like to do without, uh, you know, a maid and help and money. <laughs> Not that I have those things, but I only have three children. And, you know, my father was gone every day. He worked five, six days a week for my entire life. He was gone from seven or eight in the morning until, you know, six or 6.30 every day. So it was on my mother. My mother took care of the family. She raised us and in, a, in an area that, you know, was obviously, you know, war strewn. This was an area where, you know, not that, not that war happened every day. It didn't. And growing up in Northern Ireland, in fact, life seemed very normal. It wasn't until much later uh, that I realized how uh, skewed life had been. To give you an example, it was not, it didn't appear unusual to me that a Catholic person wouldn't drink in a Protestant bar. Protestants wouldn't drink in a Catholic bar. If I was getting gas in my car, I would stop at a Catholic-owned gas station. 
uh, if you were going for groceries, you would shop in a, a store that was owned by Catholics. So we went to schools, Catholic, Catholics went to Catholic school, Protestants went to Protestant school. And so the two societies, there was this sectarian division that started out being political uh, between England and Ireland, but wound up becoming religious in nature. It was British people were Protestants, Irish people were Catholics, and it became sectarian, Catholics against Protestants. And that went on for 30 years. Uh, and as I say, you know, having grown up in the middle of a war, uh, you do everything that other kids do, basically. You uh, go outside and you play and you go to school and you date and you buy a car and you get a job. All these things seem perfectly normal if the environment you were brought up in, uh, a child will accept absolutely anything as normal, uh, given, given the, the, the right circumstances or not having any outside perspective on what, uh, what, a, what, a, what a normal life might look like. So to us, it felt normal. To us, we had, uh, you know, a, a seemingly normal uh, childhood. We were, we never went hungry. We always had clothes. We went to school, and uh, and we played a lot. This was in the days before social media and computers, and uh, you know, you go outside, and you know, you mightn't come back till dark every day, and nobody said, "Where are you?" Um, but for my mother, uh, having three young boys. Of course, growing up in Northern Ireland, the concern was that her sons would join some kind of a military uh, organization, specifically speaking, the IRA, and get involved uh, as young boys my age did. Because as we grew and became teenagers, we became more and more angry at the oppression and at how our fathers were being treated, how our uncles were being treated, how the women were being made feel, uh, you know, that we were second class citizens in our own country. It starts to become more clear. Um, also, I have to say that I was always sort of a troubled kid. And I don't know which came first, the, uh, the chicken or the egg, uh, but I was always, even in my teens, quite troubled and uh, got into a lot of trouble smashed a lot of cars, got into a lot of fights, uh, didn't, uh, didn't do very much work at school. And by the time I was 18, I was drinking alcoholically. And uh, I wanted nothing to do with Northern Ireland. I wanted to get out of Northern Ireland as quickly as possible and go somewhere and party like kids do. <laughs> and I did. I went to London. At the age of, at the age of 18, I moved to London. And I was squatting in a, a, a housing estate in North London with a crew of uh, Irish expats, and it was like the Wild West. Something that happened while I was in London squatting there, and uh, I've written about it in my new novel, Church End, about that uh, fictionalized that time period. Uh, also, I talk about it in my memoir, that's that. But something important happened in. Uh, in London, in that squat, somebody gave me a, a book of poetry uh, by Charles Bukowski. Uh, actually, it wasn't a book of poetry, I apologize. It was a novel called Post Office. And I read it, and it was the first time I read a book and thought, I could do this. I understand what this person is saying. I can identify with the story and the character, and this is something I could do. It excited me. And I started, that was the first time the idea that I could be a writer, I could do what this man is doing. And, uh, and, and I, I didn't do it right away. I was, I was writing notes. I didn't have enough confidence in myself. I was, I was, uh, I, I was drinking a lot to mask a lot of, social anxiety and trauma and fear. 
at the time. Uh, I didn't know it, obviously. I was uh, just a kid partying and having fun. So during that period of uh, living in London, I would go back to the north of Ireland, go back to London. I'd go back to Ireland, see my parents. And in one of the times I was back home during like a couple of months at home, uh, trying to get my act together, there was a massacre in a local town. There were eight young Irish boys who were in the IRA. And some of them I knew. They were boys that I knew. And they went to attack a police station. Now, the British Army had been tipped off ahead of time and knew that they were going. And they surrounded the area. And when the boys showed up, they massacred them. They could have arrested them. I call it a massacre because it was unnecessary. They knew who the boys were. They knew where they were going. They knew when they were going. And they could have just as easily arrested them at the beginning, but they didn't. Uh, at the time, there was a policy. Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, and Margaret Thatcher of England, and, and Margaret Thatcher had decided that she was fed up with uh, the IRA being so wily and so hard to tame. And she had sort of given the British Army free reign to start shooting people instead of uh, taking them in and, you know, giving them a fair trial and maybe putting them in jail, she decided, let's just kill some of them, which is what happened. And, uh, you know, Loch Gall, Loch Gall Massacre, and you can look this up, uh, you'll see videos of it, I'm sure, on YouTube and whatnot. But in the Loch Gall Massacre, I went to three wakes in one day, and uh, I saw those boys that I knew, and they had been shot in the face. And, you know, the IRA were there with their hoods on at either end of the coffin, and, you know, the families are there, and these boys had been brutalized uh, and it was a horrible situation. I didn't I didn't realize it until much later what a horrible situation it was because again I was 18 and not really well myself. After that I realized that things it was a very heated moment in the the war in the north of Ireland between England and Ireland and I just really decided after Loch Gall I wanted out. I wanted to go as far away from all of that as possible. Uh, I was confused. I was angry. And I knew that if I stayed, I too was liable to pick up a gun and uh, avenge the death of my my friends. And uh, my mother, my mother uh, recognized that in me. And she asked me, she said, what she said, she said an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing for a mother to say. She said, if you, I know what you're thinking about doing. And if you pick up the gun, your two younger brothers are going to follow you because they look up to you and they will do exactly as you do. So when you pick up that gun, know that you're taking their lives in your hands. This decision is not for you, it's for them also. And that was an amazingly powerful thing for perhaps only a mother could have come up with such a, a foolproof method of opening her child's eyes to the danger at hand. And uh, I got on a plane and I, I moved to New York at the age of 20. And uh, I arrived in New York, in America, and I could not believe the freedom that I felt. Uh, and I know, you know, for those of you who have been born here, knowing what freedom tastes like when you have not had freedom in your life is a very, very, very powerful thing. And it's important to remember what this country stands for in that regard. Uh, I was going to the Irish area in the Bronx, McLean Avenue. And here were all these Irish boys, you know, they were green, white, and gold, our national flag, which we could not fly at home in Ireland. It was, you couldn't fly your own flag. You couldn't wear a green, white, and gold T-shirt uh, without getting in trouble with the law. Uh, and it was amazing that suddenly it was okay to be Irish. I could be Irish, 
in America, and it was okay. And that was uh, that was just the most amazing uh, moment for me. So now here I am, this Irish person. I talk about identity again, and uh, now I'm in America, and I think I'm going to stay for a year, maybe two. But I stay longer, and I get a job, and I'm working construction, and I'm drinking, and we're making a lot of you know money. We're, we're making a, 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 you're working construction back in the late eighties, early nineties. It was like the wild west, and Irish carpenters uh, and construction workers, which I was, uh, could walk out of one job on a Wednesday and be in a new job on a Thursday. There was just no end. To that sort of uh, to the work, and there was an enormous influx of Irish immigrants at that time. Uh, people fleeing Northern Ireland, also fleeing uh, Southern Ireland, uh, because of lack of work, lack of opportunities. Uh, it, there was a huge migration in the late eighties. It hasn't been matched since. That was the last big migration, and then to realize that 40 million Americans are of Irish descent. That is an insane amount of people to have started off somewhere back in our lineage on the island of Ireland, which is really only 100 miles wide and 300 miles long. It's a tiny little island in the middle of the, in the Atlantic. Uh, shoulder up, shouldered up against England, but here in America, we have forty million people of Irish descent, and that was just to me was mind boggling, and the first indication that in this country we're all immigrants, we're all immigrants, German American, Irish American, Mexican American, uh, and and I found in that, and I found in New York my tribe and i felt like for the first time that i was home that i was home i was among people who felt as i did many who had escaped oppression and uh hardship and financial hardship and and they were there to work and better themselves and uh and not that i did i didn't right away i was a mess i was a young man and i was a mess and i drank heavily and i moved to san francisco uh, chasing madness, and at the age of 23, I sobered for the first time. I got sober. I realized I had a major drinking problem. I had issues that I was not dealing with, and I quit drinking. And then I moved back to New York, and I had a very unfortunate situation. About a year later, I was sober, and I was hit by a car on McLean Avenue in the Bronx, and uh, I broke my back in two places and I wound up in a body brace for a year. And I considered going home to Ireland because I was a burden. Uh, people had to take care of me. I couldn't work. I couldn't, I, I, was, I couldn't even leave my apartment for a couple of months uh, when it first happened. And I was told I would never work construction again, that I would probably be somewhat crippled from it. Uh, but my determination to keep going was uh, stronger than the injury, and uh, I forced myself back out after some time and started working again. But what something else that happened at that time that was quite unfortunate and I didn't understand until later was I was taking painkillers for my broken back, and because I'm an addict and an alcoholic, I wound up abusing that for the next seven years while I was sober. So I wasn't really sober. I wasn't really dealing with anything. I was, I was still able to keep a lid on uh, everything. On the on the outside, my life was very normal, and I, I became you know quite successful in my life. Uh, by the time I was thirty one years of age, I had uh, I, in my in my mid twenties, I started writing seriously. I wrote a couple of novels uh, that wound up in a drawer. <laughs> for for 30 years. <laughs> I, I went to college and I started studying with Billy Collins, who would become the U.S. Poet Laureate while I was studying with him, and he became my mentor. Uh, he became a two-time Poet Laureate and, you know, arguably the most famous living poet uh, today in, in America. And while I studied with him, I really started taking my writing seriously. I opened up a used bookstore coffee shop in Riverdale in the Bronx. 
And then at the age of 31, I picked up a drink again, just after I published my first short story. In retrospect, uh, it seemed like I couldn't handle emotionally uh, something good happening, and I tore it all to shreds. I tore my life to shreds. And I started drinking at the age of 31, and I went on a bender for eight years. And when I say a bender, I drank, I drank, I did drugs, I smashed cars, I went to jail, I bounced from apartment to apartment, from relationship to relationship, until my life was absolutely destroyed. At the age of 30, and I didn't write a single word for eight years, for eight years, after spending seven years building up this idea and a base for myself uh, as a writer, I tore it all to shreds. At the age of 38, I was living in Hell's Kitchen. I weighed uh, 115 pounds. I hadn't eaten solid food in a couple of weeks. I slept with a bottle of whiskey next to the bed because I would shake after four hours of not having a drink. And my friends were saying, you're going to die here. This is it. This is the end. And, uh, and, and one of them came and took me to a farmhouse upstate to sober up. And uh, over the next year, uh, I wound up in jail again for a couple of months. And then at the age of 39, I finally put down the drink. I stopped drinking and I started writing. And I started writing as if my life depended on it. Because it did, because it did at that, at that time it did. And I didn't know who I was. I realized I came out of this day as a 39 years of age. I didn't know who I was. I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have an apartment. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a bank account. I was broke, penniless, and unemployable. And I started writing, and I wrote a memoir that got published of my drinking years, and it got published. It got picked up by Random House, and they published it in 2009. My, my memoir, Orangutan, about those years drinking. And they immediately asked me to write about, they, they thought it was so insane, uh, the story of my life. And they said, you have to write about why, why were you this messed up? And it was the first time in my life that I finally sat down and started looking at my childhood and who I was, where I had come from, and what trauma I had been carrying around with me from my entire adult life. And that book was published by Random House in 2014, and it saved my life. That book saved my writing. That book saved my life because it forced me to stop finally and look at myself and stop running. And I can't tell you the pain that I went through writing. I had a mental breakdown in the middle of that book. I demanded at one point that Random House give it back to me. I wanted out of my contract. Here I had wound up getting exactly what I wanted in life. And I wanted out of it because I was suddenly confronted with my own emotional trauma, my own emotional pain from my childhood. But I didn't. I published the book and it saved me. And facing my trauma finally and dealing with my stop when I stopped running and dealing with my own trauma. I finally came back to a place when I cleared all the rubble of my life, there was a solid floor there and I felt calm for the first time. And in the last six years, seven years, I have been living a life beyond my wildest dreams. I haven't had a drink in 12 years. Uh, I'm in a very uh, happy uh, supportive, loving marriage. We have our six year uh, wedding anniversary this Sunday. Uh, we've been married six years. And I have three beautiful children and my daughter, Erica, who's 12, uh, my son, Samuel, who's four, and we just had a little baby boy, Bruce. And my children never saw me drunk. They don't know who that is. Maybe at some point later in life, They'll uh, stumble upon my memoir, Orangutan, and decide they want to know 
this other side of their father. I look back at that time in my life and I don't recognize myself because I was so far removed from, from who I was. And what I discovered about myself was I'm not a bad guy. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not perfect, but I'm not a bad guy. I don't hate myself anymore. I discovered that I can write. I'm actually writing for a living now. And I discovered that I had the capacity for joy and love and hope. And that is an amazing thing to be in your mid 40s and finally realizing who you are and feeling like a kid again because you have an opportunity to do it right this time and enjoy it. In the last 12 years since I quit drinking, I've published four books. And I started making feature movies a couple, uh, five, six years ago. My second feature, uh, my first feature movie, Emerald City, is on uh, uh, YouTube. You can go watch it. Uh, it won a few awards. It screened all over America, England, Ireland. Uh, and my second feature movie will be premiering, hopefully, in Northern Ireland before the end of the year. And uh, I just released a new book uh, this, this uh, week, a novel that I wrote in. I took out of a box that I'd written in my mid-twenties called Church End, my first novel, and I polished it up and I published it uh, just this week. And the thing that I, where I am right now, when I go back again to identity and who I am and who we are as Americans, and never has that conversation been more vital than it is right now today. Uh, I have realized now that I am an Irish American. I, I, I've become an Irish American because I've lived in this country now for 31 years, which is longer than I ever lived in Ireland. It's longer than I lived in England. This has become my home, my family, my friends, the idea of freedom. And this is hard to imagine given the current state of chaos in politics in this country. But as someone who's come from the outside, it's important to know this. This is still as good as it gets. America is still as good as it gets. There is a reason that the rest of the world looked up to us for so long, for guidance, for decency, for protection, to lead the way. And we can be that again, but we can't be that separately. We can't be that separately. We have to be that together. And when you go out and vote, vote with your heart, but vote for decency. And I would ask that you vote for unity. This country needs to be unified again, because in unity, there is strength. And when we are unified, uh, we are a powerful, powerful movement of peace and uh, example for the rest of the world and all the other places that are living with oppression much worse than what we are experiencing. And, uh, you know, take a moment to reflect on how good we have it here still, still to this day. We still have it good. We don't know it, but we do and protect that, protect our democracy. I'm an Irish American, I'm proud to be here, and it is an honor to be speaking to you at Laredo. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to, to share my story. And maybe we'll do a, a few Q and A now with some questions. Are you ready for questions? Sure. Okay. So question number one. Whoops, hold on. Are you gonna read me the question? Yeah, I'm gonna read you the question. How do I do this? What is the most asked question about how you grew up? What was it like to grow up in the troubles? People are fascinated by the growing up in a war in Northern Ireland. There was also this romance uh, here in America about the 
the, the trouble in Ireland. For some reason, you know, we, we, we're very selective on, on how we choose our heroes and how we romance trouble. And for some reason, the war in Northern Ireland took on a sort of romantic, heroic, uh, sort of the little guy fighting the empire. It was, you know, the Northern Irish Catholics were going to bring down the British Empire. And we couldn't be beat. So I think people are fascinated by that aspect of growing up in Northern Ireland. The truth, of course, is that it was much uglier on the ground. It's not romantic. Uh, and and since 1998, we've had peace in Northern Ireland and Catholics and Protestants, young Catholic and Protestant children are not even aware, for the most part, that there was a war that you know young catholics and protestants drink together in the same bars they would never social media has leveled that uh that sort of social awkward sectarianism and kids in ireland are like kids in america they just want to text their friends and you know play video games <laughs> <laughs> All right, second question. They want to know, do you still keep in touch with Fergal? Oh, my God, who is Fergal in the book? That's a good question. Yes, yes, I do. In fact, uh, I, I went to visit him uh, when I was back home. Uh, I protected the names and the identities of some of the people. Uh, I will tell you if you've read... Uh, my book, uh, Orangutan, uh, one of the main characters in there, one of my very dear friends, Dermot Kenny, who uh, produced my first play, uh, took his own life uh, two years ago. He jumped off the George Washington Bridge, and it was uh, maybe the most tragic loss I've experienced in my uh in my lifetime. He was a very dear friend. And he was struggling uh, with all the same things that I had been struggling with. And I can't stress that enough. If you have problems, seek the help. Uh, don't let ego keep you from saying, I'm not feeling well. I'm depressed. I'm struggling with not being able to quit drinking. I'm struggling, struggling with not being able to quit doing drugs when I start. And, and get help because I think people have this idea that a sober life is somewhat boring. And I can tell you that my life since I've quit dr drinking uh, has been, it's what an adventure. I've, I've been all over the world making, making movies and writing books and, you know, going to movie premieres and, you know, all those things that I thought, you know, at one time, not that they seem important to me anymore, but all these amazing journeys that you that, that i found myself on uh i think i just i just want to stress that you know especially because it's an incoming class because especially because you're younger you're dealing what a strange time to be alive and dealing with all these ideas of identity and loneliness and disconnection and all those things and uh you know just really take care of yourself and and be honest with your friends and make sure that people know who you are inside. Let them know how you're feeling. Let people know how you're feeling. I do that now, and uh, I do it with with everybody. I'm I'm a pretty open book, and, and and it's a much better way of life. It's a fun fun way to live. But anyway, sorry, I got off uh, your verbal question, but that's uh, did you write the book with the intention of showing it to your daughter when she's older? <laughs> Uh, uh, good question. I, I guess, I guess I did write it that it is a record of who I am, uh, and she will. I think my daughter Erica, she's twelve now, going on seventeen. She'd probably read it and roll her eyes. Uh, she's, you know, younger generation now are so much more, I think, clued in than we ever were. We lived very sheltered lives. Uh, growing up, uh, we didn't know, you know, how the, the birds and the bees worked until 
much later in life. <laughs> I feel like young children now have been exposed to so much that it take a take a lot more to, to shock them. What I what I what I like to impart to my daughter is uh, we have a very open relationship, and I talk to my daughter about everything that matters about how she's feeling emotionally, and I try to I try to make that. Uh, that, that we have a communication that it doesn't matter if she reads the book or doesn't read the book. I expect her to grow up and fall on her face and make mistakes and have an adventure of her own. And I'm not going to keep her swaddled in cotton balls so that that doesn't happen. Uh, you know, that's just part of being a kid and growing up and, you know, getting to know who we are and where our boundaries are. And, and and finding her own identity in the world. So I don't protect her from that. I just let her know that I uh, I have a relationship with her that she could always come home to me, uh, no matter what it is she reads or whatever it is she's going on in her own personal life. Next question is: Do you think your parents thought that you would be publishing books and writing movies and all of that? That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, in, in, since I've sobered so many people in my family and friends, people would say to me, man, you got to quit drinking and doing drugs because you're our guy. It was as if my family and my community of people, even guys that I work construction with, they understood that my role in the tribe was to be the storyteller. They understood it better than I did and before I did. And people would say it to me, you got to get out of this bar, you got to go right. And that would astonish me. And I think it's probably less of a surprise to people who know me. Although if people who knew me when I was really bad drinking and drugging were just astonished that I lived, that I survived, that's really the miracle. Uh, and I guess to come out of it, come out of it with enough brain cells and, uh, enough emotional wherewithal to build a successful life as a writer and as a father and a husband and a filmmaker. That that part is just, it is not a day goes by that doesn't astound me. I'm astounded. So we're going to have one more question and then uh, students, we have some instructions for you um, to exit. So last question is, did you ever consider joining the IRA? Yes. Many, many, many times. And for a long time after I left Ireland, I had a lot of guilt that I didn't, that friends of mine joined and fought and some of them died. And there, I, I remember those boys and I hold them in great. Uh, I, I, I have. They're, they're, they, I hold them in a very a place of very high esteem in my heart. Uh, you know, in the years since those freedom fighters have been, uh, people have tried to tar them with the brush of terrorism, brand them with the name terrorism, and I refuse to recognize that about the boys that I knew because they weren't terrorists. They were standing up and fighting for our rights at the time. And the British Army and the British were not listening to anything other than that. It was the it was the last resort and they used it. And I feel a lot of guilt sometimes. I, I'm so happy that we live in peace now, but I remember why and I remember uh, that I didn't. And uh, I feel guilty about that sometimes, but I, but I know now and have accepted that the reason that I was protected for my journey was because my role was to survive long enough to write about it so that they would not be forgotten. Thank you so much for joining us, Colin. We really appreciate it. And the students have enjoyed your book and thank you for being here. Thank you so much. What a great honor. Uh, oh, dust devils. <laughs> We're giving you virtual claps. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so students, uh, if you're leaving, you need to exit through the um, parking lot closest, the entrance closest to the soccer field. 
So please exit entrance closest to the solid field. And if you have your voter registration, please turn on your lights and they'll come get them. So uh, they're gonna turn on the lights right now so that you all can exit safely, but please exit. Uh, we're gonna go row by row, okay? So just please wait for a volunteer. All right, thank you, Colin. Thank you, I'll jump out now, okay? Yes, bye. Stay uh, home, everyone. Thanks a lot, Colin. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mr. Ivan. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. All right. Bye, Roberto. Yes. <laughs> bye. 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 Thank you.